India was home to more Muslims than any other country on earth. Yet here, they were a minority. Britain's wartime need for allies was to give the Muslims the power to redraw the map of India. sight of a fire-swept Burmese town by night. The awful result of a Japanese attack on a completely undefended town from which the population fled as the place is gutted by a wholesale fire. Summer 1942. The Second World War was going badly for Britain. The Japanese had overrun Malaya, Singapore, and now Burma. The war had reached the frontier of India. Burma, India's neighbor, had no rail links with India. No proper roads. British troops, with no experience of tropical warfare, were forced into a long retreat back into India. By May, the Japanese loomed over the subcontinent. In one week, they sank a hundred ships off the east coast. Their bombers terrified India's eastern cities. When the raids came, the Japanese had carrier bomb uh, aircraft <coughs> who attacked Ceylon, and we had a, a squadron of hurricanes uh, and um, no Spitfires. I remember talking to the officer who commanded this squadron. And he told me that after that, he hadn't got one hurricane that could take the air. There was really um, absolutely nothing at that stage at all. If the Japanese had had the strength to march into India, uh, you know, there was nothing to stop them. India had eight anti-aircraft guns. Invasion was expected daily. A million people fled Calcutta. Wavell came in, commander in chief, and uh, <clears throat> uh, he stood in front of the map. Uh, he was just going to go home, and he was uh, just leaving office. He just came in and said, um, uh, any, anything for me before I go? And he stood in front of the map and ruminated about the map. And he said, just imagine how stretched the Japanese must be at this moment. Um, They've pushed on much quicker than they thought they could. They've taken all this enormous area uh, from us and from the Dutch. Uh, and uh, they've been right down to uh, Singapore. And they've come right up to Burma. They must be stretched absolutely to the limit. If I had anything, I'd go for them now. I remember he said, if I had, if I had one division fit to fight, I'd go for them now. He said, he looked at them standing there like a little terrier in front of a, in front of a rat, I thought. Uh, and. Um, but I haven't, I haven't got one division fit to fight. You see, we'd, we'd sent two divisions to Egypt by this time. Uh, we got the 4th and 5th Indian divisions in Egypt. We'd sent a, an army to Malaya, which had got into the bag almost as soon as it got there. Uh, and we'd lost uh, an army in Burma. Um, and um, we were really absolutely down to the bone. Indians, too, were in a dilemma. They disliked Hitler but they didn't trust Britain's Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. 
Congress, India's largest independence movement, were divided. Some wanted action against the British. Others wanted to fight for Britain in return for a guarantee of independence. Congress turned to the Mahatma, the great soul, Mohandas K. Gandhi. He was the inspired leader of non-violent protest, which his followers repeatedly turned to violence. The head of British security showed the Viceroy, Lord Linlithgow, detailed evidence of Congress plans for disruption. The Viceroy decided he must act fast. He showed me files showing, and how they had it, I don't know, but reports of committee meetings of Congress in various parts of the country in which assaults on police stations and on uh, railways and so on were, were being planned. Uh, after which I said to Lynn Lithgow, I'm entirely convinced, I think you've no alternative. Congress, at their August 1942 meeting, followed Gandhi. They demanded that the British should quit India. The next day, all the top leaders were arrested at dawn. Overnight, the head and shoulders were chopped off India's largest political party. Young congressmen woke up not knowing which way to turn. I rushed to a telephone talk. All lines disconnected. So we could not get contact with anybody. In the early morning, we had walked up to the roads. We found all the roads deserted. Went up, went up to some extent on the Kalwa Devi road and people were moving. And then we learned that all our leaders have been arrested and Gandhiji has been given the message that every worker is a leader by himself. He has to take action as he chooses. Gandhi's followers wanted to hear his instructions, but his final words before his arrest only confused them. Each man his own leader, do or die. The British must leave India, if need be, to God. If that is too much, then leave her to anarchy. On August the 9th, 1942, as Gandhi and the Congress leaders were arrested, rebellion erupted in the north of the country. India's biggest steel plant stopped work. And after the burning down of a parachute factory, a worried viceroy wrote to Churchill about this widespread sabotage of our war effort. If we bungle this business now, we shall damage India irretrievably as a base for future Allied operations. In late August, telephone lines were cut between the commercial capital Calcutta and the government at Delhi. The rebellion turned many liberal-minded Englishmen into Congress haters. Their anger increased by the taunts of Congress radio. We used to shift from one place to another because the police were chasing us. So in all, we operated for about six months. And in the, during this time, we changed six to seven places. Every 15 days or 16 days, we used to change. We had our own call sign and the reception also was very good. We used to begin like this, that this is Congress radio calling from somewhere in India on 42.34 meters. The All India Congress Committee assures students who have left their British controlled studies to take part in the Freedom Revolution that laws and ordinances now being promulgated by the tottering Indian branch of the British state will have no validity or application in the free state of India. The All India Congress Committee congratulates workers on strike for their unretreating determination not to resume work until freedom of India is achieved. 
The British were hard pressed everywhere in 1942. No more Indian troops to Africa. The offensive to recapture Burma was delayed. The Quit India Rebellion took a month to suppress. Most British now hated Congress. They were not alone. Muslims feared and loathed both Congress and the 300 million Hindu majority. The Muslims now became Britain's ally in the war. Britain's about face, playing the Muslim card, was to change India forever. There's no doubt that the British at that time were pretty angry with the, with the Congress and the Hindus, and pretty friendly with the Muslims. Well, it's understandable, the Muslims were, help, were helping, although they never officially supported the war effort, they were in fact helping, and the Congress were not. And that's where the ordinary British are said to hell with the Congress. The only All India Muslim Party, the Muslim League, had patchy support from the 90 million Muslims. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, its leader, now saw his chance to make the League the champion of Muslim India. With Congress leaders in jail, Jinnah could win British support. But he had to be careful. The League must appear as a nationalist party. Jinnah's best tactic was to demand a separate Muslim state in India, Pakistan. It was to be a haven in the northwest and the northeast, where the Muslims were a majority. It would be a Muslim homeland, freedom from Hindu Congress domination. Pakistan was a rallying cry, a slogan with mass appeal. Jinnah began to swing Muslim India behind him. Jinnah never lost his nerve. But on the more general field, his great strength was his complete intransigence. His philosophy of life was never compromised. If you start giving way at, uh, at one point, you give way everywhere. Fight the walls, fight the battle on the ramparts, and not on the citadels. And uh, that, of course, very often meant being unreasonable. But I think if Jinnah had spoken frankly, he'd said you have to be unreasonable in order to get your own way. Jinnah got his way more and more. He was determined that the Muslims of India would show a united front for the League and Pakistan. That suited the British. They too wanted the Muslims united, but behind the war effort. Only in India, the reserve barracks, were there millions of men ready to fight for Britain worldwide. Britain could not afford to antagonize the Muslims, who made up a third of India's army. One person in eight of everybody living in the Royal Pindi area is a soldier. So the Premier of the Punjab, having thanked them for what they've done for the country, told them what the country was going to do for them. The British drew closer to the Muslims. Meanwhile, Jinnah took advantage of the Empire's wartime need for Muslim soldiers to advance the League. So the field was open for the Muslim Leaguers to go and uh, explain their point of view to the Indian Muslims as such and to the people at large. And there Mr. Jinnah used to talk, uh, sometimes he used to talk, I remember one speech of his which he made in Gujarat and he said, why not we and the Congress join hands together and face the John Bull? You see, that type of speeches he also used to make those days, you see. And that's why he became more popular. That used to satisfy the anti-British uh, sentiments of the Indian Muslims also and uh, his demand for Pakistan, his emotional I mean, appeal and all that made him more popular and indirectly the British government when they left them uh, in the field single-handedly, openly, that uh, means that the British government to see, um, encouraged them, you see, indirectly, not openly, indirectly, by giving them the open field. A free hand. You know. A free hand, you see, in explaining their point of view to the people at large. The British thought Pakistan was just a harmless slogan to boost the League's popularity. Few took the demand seriously, or even believed Jinnah was serious about it. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Jinnah was cooperative. So, behind the scenes, the British offered the League a helping hand. Jinnah, 
now growing in popularity, sent his number two, Liaquat Ali Khan, to talk to the British. He wanted to start a Muslim League newspaper, but he needed money. The Muslims were helping the war effort. They wanted to start a paper, a paper called Dawn. And, and we helped it by giving them advertisements. No, no direct subsidy, but giving them all kinds of government advertisements. Who approached you from the Muslims? Liaquat Ali Khan himself. And what happened? Oh, we gave him the, gave him, we gave him the advertisements. On a regular basis? Yes. Large sums of money? Enough to get the paper launched, really, is what it really came to. Was it agreed that both sides would keep quiet about this? I don't think we ever came to any uh, tacit agreement about it. But it was obviously to the interest of both sides not to talk about it. Churchill was determined to maintain the support of the Muslims. In June 1943, he appointed a new viceroy. Lord Wavell had been commander-in-chief of the Indian Army. Wavell immediately gave Churchill a surprise. The war was now going well. Wavell pressed for Congress and the League to be brought into the government at Delhi, while Britain still had power to shape events in India. He wanted Congress leaders out of jail and into government. The cabinet in London said no. Wavell wrote in his diary, I do not believe these men face their fences honestly. They profess anxiety to give India self-government, but will take no risk to make it possible. The cabinet is not honest in its expressed desire to make progress in India. Wavell soon released Gandhi from detention. He was sick and his wife had died. Pakistan was the talking point of India. Jinnah was now the undisputed leader of the Muslims. Gandhi left his prison cell and immediately went to meet his arch rival. It was a turning point for the Muslim League. I remember distinctly that after every meeting, I used to give him a sort of resume of what was happening and then he would ask me, well, what is Mr. Gandhi doing? Because Gandhi had only recently then been released from jail and uh, they were each, both of them trying to keep track of each other's footsteps. So that made me aware of the fact that uh, Mr. Jinnah was uh, always very keen to know every move, every step that Gandhi took, every word that he uttered, every little statement of Gandhi was kept recorded, pasted in a separate scrapbook. Gandhi, the master of publicity, had made a mistake. By simply talking to Jinnah, he forced the world's press to treat them as equals. Gandhi brought the Muslim League the public attention that Jinnah himself could never have won. Mr. Gandhi uh, told Mr. Jinnah, well, Jinnah, you have mesmerized the Muslims. He said, so what? You have hypnotized the Hindus. Naturally, the Gandhi Jinnah talks attracted the whole world. It gave Mr. Jinnah a very good opportunity to tell the world what he wanted and explain to the world the stand of the Muslim nation. And Mr. Gandhi, at the same time, uh, also, I think, got an argument that he tried his best. Gandhi reluctantly moved some way towards the Pakistan idea. Jinnah said no, it was not enough. While Gandhi put on a brave smile, the triumph was Jinnah's. They had nothing to give to one another, except future promises and good hopes, maybe. The deadlock confirmed Wavell's view that Indians excluded from government would argue forever. He wrote to Churchill, I am bound to say, after a year's experience in my present office, I feel that the vital problems of India are being treated by His Majesty's government with neglect, sometimes even with hostility and contempt. Wavell wanted to come home to put his case. Churchill refused. When he finally agreed, he kept the Viceroy waiting for two months before seeing him. The unfortunate Wavell couldn't even arrange an interview with any of the Indian political leaders without asking the permission of Churchill, who in fact 
ran Indian policy and decided what Wavell should and should not do. Churchill's own view about I India was that we should hold on as long as possible and, um, he, and only make concessions to Indian constitutional advance if the pressure became so strong that we couldn't do otherwise. Wavell found his position untenable in the sense that he was trying to carry out a policy in India uh, which was directly contrary to the policy that was desired by his political masters. In May 1945, the European war ended. Churchill faced a general election in Britain. If Wavell resigned, India would become an election issue. So Churchill let Wavell release the rest of the Congress leaders from jail and invite Indian politicians to a conference to discuss a new government in Delhi that would prepare the way for independence. Churchill's wartime policy had weakened Congress and helped unite the Muslims behind Jinnah. Congress emerged to find the Muslim League on the move. Shouting and cheering, the public gave Nehru a terrific welcome. Nehru could still bring out the crowds, but he knew that Congress was now a rusty machine. He started at once the difficult task of rebuilding the party, both its membership and organization. Wavell called the Indian leaders to the Viceroy's summer retreat at Simla in June 1945. He hoped that the conference would create a united government of Muslims and Hindus. With the British election set for July, Wavell tried to push India forward before a new government at home took office. Meanwhile at Dada, Pandit Nehru addressed a mammoth gathering. History was in the making. Indian leaders were about to discuss a plan which was calculated to change India's destiny and place her more prominently on the map of the world. Similar, Indian leaders met to discuss Lord Wavell's solution of the political deadlock. Mr. Gandhi, invited by Lord Wavell for a preliminary discussion, arrives by car and enters the compound of Manaville, residence of his hostess, Rajkumari Amrit Kaur. Wavell's plan was a bold one. A government composed entirely of Indian politicians, except for the Viceroy and Army Commander-in-Chief, would pave the way for a transfer of power to Indian hands. But Churchill's wartime encouragement of the Muslims had changed the political balance in India. All eyes were now not on Gandhi, but on Jinnah. Similar citizens turned out in large numbers to cheer the leaders whose deliberations would mould India's destiny. Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, president of the Muslim League, met the Viceroy soon after Mr. Gandhi. On that fateful day, many wondered what stand this brilliant lawyer would take. The atmosphere was charged with expectancy. He felt that the Muslims were the weakest of the three. The British held the power, they held the strings of power, the Hindus held the majority. So if there was a democratic system in a free united India, the Hindus would, would gain everything. So the Muslims could not sort of afford to annoy both. But Mr. Jinnah, he had a bit of a gambler in him. He took the risk. Wavell was generous to the Muslims. Though only a quarter of India's population, they were offered as many places in his new executive council as the Hindus. The proposed new council would represent the main communities and would include equal proportions of caste Hindus and Muslims. Congress accepted this, despite their overwhelming majority in the country. They hoped for a share of real power at last. Jinnah then dropped a bombshell. He said only League Muslims could sit in the Viceroy's council. But Congress too had Muslim members. Its president, Maulana Azad, was a Muslim. Jinnah said even he must be kept out. 
his audacity shocked everyone. Mr. Jinnah spent three hours explaining to me the Muslims are a separate nation. As a separate nation, they require a separate homeland and they have a separate party. That is the Muslim League. The Hindus are a separate nation. They want a separate homeland. They have got one party, that is the Congress. The moment I, I, I give in to the view that the Muslims have different views about the fate of India, that there can be a representative, a genuine popular representative of the Muslims who is not a Muslim leaguer and not committed to Pakistan, then I give up my whole strength as the third force in India. And I completely understood that point. His strategy at that time was to get the Congress to acknowledge this fact that the Muslims were represented by the Muslim League and that the only the sole authoritative representative body of the Muslims of India was the Muslim League. But the Congress was not willing to do it. The Congress, of course, had uh, its own reasons because of its nationalism and because Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, who happened to be a Muslim, was the president of the Congress, so they found it very difficult. And Mr. Jinnah's main aim in the 1945 talks with Lord Wavell was to establish his sole authoritative capacity. Congress leaders argued that millions of Muslims supported them. Jinnah's claim to represent all India's Muslims had no basis. But the reason was very simple. Because all the Muslims of the country did not accept Jinnah as their leader. And so long as there were Muslims who did not accept him as their leader, it was not honest on our part to accept Jinnah as the sole representative of the Muslim community in this country. Congress insisted on the freedom to nominate anyone. Wavell agreed that Jinnah's demand to choose all the Muslims was unreasonable, and he rejected it. Jinnah then refused to join the council. Wavell knew that a council without Jinnah would be vetoed by Churchill, so Wavell could do nothing. Jinnah had a veto. They tried to overawe him, they tried to browbeat him, they tried to threaten him, they tried to purchase him, but he proved impervious to all threats and all uh, uh, inducements, which proved to the Muslims generally that he was a man who cannot let them down. And he was therefore their only leader, accepted leader who should be followed right to the end. The crowds danced in Piccadilly. The war was over at last. For the city which for the whole duration of the war had been in the front line of battle, this was deliverance indeed. The men and women of the home front rejoiced for their allies of the United Nations in a tidal wave of emotion too deep for words. The British could now turn their attention to home affairs. The Labour Party had won the election. They promised domestic reform. Imperial greatness was on the way out, the welfare state on the way in. Another great cheer greeted the forces of India, whose magnificent fighting record is now saluted by Britain and her people. Gurkhas, Sikhs, Marathas, all were there. The men for whom this triumphal march was a fulfillment of all their hard-won victories. London gave these men from the hills and plains of India a very special cheer. Hopes were high that India might now be cut loose from the empire. In July 1945, Clement Attlee became Prime Minister. Labour's promise that India would be given her independence seemed close to fulfilment. But despite the cheers and victory parades, Britain was exhausted by six years of fighting. The huge conscript army were clamouring to get out of uniform. 
soldiers wanted to come home from India and from all over the world. Well, the most visible evidence, I suppose, was the rapid departure of British troops from, the, from India, which built up to a rate of about one division a month. They were visibly growing, and there was no way by which a Labour government or the troops themselves would have been willing to delay their departure. Just as soon as shipping was available, they wanted out. So you're talking of a crumbling of the British element of force, the British element of, in the administration, the Indian police. This would produce impossible tensions and was not a thing we could rely on carrying forward. The new Labour government wanted to leave quickly. Britain was proud of the unity the Raj had imposed on India. Congress wanted the country to stay united, but Jinnah demanded Pakistan, which meant partition. Many millions of Muslims were now behind him. Just how many, the government in Delhi did not at first realize. When I got there at the end of, towards the, in the autumn of 45, I was astonished when I was asked, how, it, what about this Pakistan demand? Is this to be taken seriously? And I said, yes, it is, in my opinion. And I was surprised at the fact that that reply ca caused some astonishment because to me it was perfectly obvious coming from this very Muslim part of, of India, as it then was, the northwest frontier, there was an insistent demand building up for Pakistan. It wasn't yet final, but it was very strong and it was there. Attlee decided to test this demand by elections. Jinnah's claim and his demand for Pakistan were put to India's voters. In the cool weather early in 1946, the campaign was bitter and often violent. The Muslim League fought the election on a platform of one word, Pakistan. There's no doubt about it that at that time the atmosphere was very much, it had swung very much in favor of Mr. Jinnah as far as the Muslims were concerned. He had just a public meeting where at least one million people were collected. The Muslims wanted to come and see him and just to see his face. They knew what he was talking, without understanding. I think they had established sort of a wavelength. Jinnah was not an impressive personality at long distance. He was a stick-like man. In other words, he was ascetic, he was very thin. He had a sort of Lazarus type appearance. Bloodless. He had a rapier-like mind. He was very fanatical in his pursuit of Pakistan. Uh, but he didn't seem to be able to speak the language. He addressed his congregation in English. And not more than half a percent could have understood English. But not a single man uttered a word. You couldn't hear a pin drop. Mr. Jinnah, wherever he went, was taken in royal processions. People would organize deceptions, setting up huge canopies and uh, organizing parties, deceptions. The election split India. Congress did spectacularly well, but the League won nearly 90% of the seats reserved for Muslims. Attlee knew that this success would make Jinnah even more difficult to handle. Two months later, the Indian Navy mutinied. Then the British were forced to abandon the trials of Indian soldiers who had fought for the Japanese. British control was slipping. Attlee decided the time had come for London to take charge of events. He told Sir Stafford Cripps, an old India hand, to go there immediately, with A.V. Alexander and Lord Pethick Lawrence, the Secretary of State for India. The cabinet mission arrived in March 1946. Their job, to secure a peaceful British exit. Almost any arrangement the Indians could agree on would do. Pethick Lawrence at 75 was quickly dubbed Pathetic Lawrence. The cabinet mission hoped to safeguard British defense and trade worldwide. For that, Indian unity, one strong country, 
not partition into two, was the British aim. At New Delhi, the three-member cabinet mission begins its historic quest to find a solution to India's political deadlock. One of the largest press conferences in Indian newspaper history, with reporters from many countries present, was held as a preliminary to the talks. Lord Pethick Lawrence, in his opening remarks, underlined the principles which would guide them during the talks. Britain's need was urgent. A weakened post-war Britain needed the Congress and the League to agree quickly on a transfer of power to Indian hands. The mission has declared that it has come with no set plan for action. Already invitations have been sent to all prominent political leaders, asking them to explain their points of view to the cabinet ministers. And as we go on the screen, prominent leaders are reported to be on their way to Delhi. The cabinet mission arrived to break the deadlock left by Jinnah's unyielding demands at the Simla conference. Lord Wavell joined them in a task he had warned for three years would become harder the longer it was delayed. The Muslims had been Churchill's allies in the war. Now, by demanding partition and Pakistan, they became the cabinet mission's main problem. Jinnah was the obstacle to the united independent India that Attlee wanted. Congress, wartime villains, were now in agreement with the British government. Both wanted to keep India as one country. The more the cabinet mission examined the fine print of partition and understood what Pakistan would mean, the more they saw the virtue of Indian unity. From the official statements that have been made, a few important facts emerge. The Muslim League demand for Pakistan is the crucial problem and much of the discussion will center around this point. After sweating it out in the Delhi heat, the three Magi, as Wavell called them, withdrew to the cool hill station at Simla. There they met Gandhi, whose influence over the masses was still immense. Cripps made particular efforts to secure Gandhi's agreement, though by now he was not even a member of Congress. So Gandhi arrived, I mean, he said, uh, because I'm not really taking part in the discussion, he said, but uh, I have appointed myself as advisor to the British nation through the cabinet mission. Cripps was terrified of Gandhi. He admired him and he felt he ought to like him. Cripps was a marvelous man, a very moral man, and Gandhi's speciality was, of course, morality. Somehow or other, Gandhi got under his skin and he could never quite cope with him. And once when Cripps was taken ill, during the period of the cabinet mission of being taken to hospital. He said to me, for goodness sake, don't let that awful man come and see me in hospital. <laughs> the mission were not sure who to talk to in Congress. Some advised that Nehru was now the key figure. Others said that the president, Azad, spoke for them. Cripps felt that Gandhi was still the driving force, though as usual, Gandhi was quite unpredictable. There was a period of German negotiation when Gandhi declined to, to have anything further to do with it. All the cabinet mission had to do was to quit India, and if it was going to be a civil war, it was God's will, and on the whole, he thought it was God's will. But after a lot of pleading, he said, all right, I'll come and see you on Thursday morning. So he arrived at one of these uh, kind of Sunningdale houses on the Vice Regal Estate, sat in a very English type of drawing room, sitting up on the sofa, and these three uh, cabinet members, uh, quite old they were, and quite distinguished, had come 5,000 miles, sat facing him, and they started talking to him. And uh, this went on for some time, they got no answer. Then he handed them a piece of paper. This is my day of silence, but please go on talking. And then <laughs> they went on talking, and all they got were little notes saying things like, uh, he who gives quickly gives twice. Jinnah, like Gandhi, gave little away. He was now the bigger puzzle. Did he really want Pakistan? Would he settle for less? He used his old tactic of not budging an inch, confident of concessions by others. He was waiting. He was waiting because he was not sure whether the British government were prepared to disclose their hand. He had to wait because he was not sure of the Congress. And of course he had to wait because if he called his end too early, he could have just exposed himself. Or if it was too late, then it would have been just too late. The Muslim League was the weakest party, but Jinnah controlled it completely. 
Unlike the Congress negotiators, he could demand whatever he wanted. He, he would always say he wanted the whole thing and nothing but uh, the whole of Pakistan. And when you said to him, but how are you going to run this economically and it's going to be very difficult, he would say, oh, just leave it to me. Give me the Pakistan and we'll see how well we'll run it. How much was that a politician's gambit, not to spell out what he wanted? Very much a politician's gambit. He was a very tough negotiator and he was very uh, determined to stick to saying one thing the whole time and not to be trapped into... Uh, concessions and complications and all the rest of it. The mission finally hammered out an agreement for independence. An Indian government in Delhi would keep control over taxation and defence. The provinces would be given generous powers and they could form into groups, almost giving the Muslims Pakistan. It was a loose federation, a united India which preserved Muslim interests. And it very nearly worked, you see, for 24 hours or more, both Congress and the Muslim League had accepted it. And I said to Jinnah, well, at least you've got some way. He said, but how can I say to my people, uh, this is Pakistan? I said, well, you can say to them it's a first step anyway, and you'll see how it works. And so he said, all right, I'll buy that, and he sold it to them. Jinnah's agreeing to a united India was a surprise. When the cabinet mission made plain Britain's determination to quit, he dropped his demand for Pakistan. What he had won was a larger share for the Muslims in the government of United India than anyone had thought possible. Congress leaders, especially Gandhi, thought he had won too much. Then I was asked to go and see Gandhi, and Gandhi said to me, oh, he said, um, you're a very mischievous man, you're a lovely man, actually, very funny. Uh, he said, um, um, you have a system in England whereby Parliament passes the laws, but the courts interpret them. And they may say uh, that what Parliament think they have passed is not at all what they have passed, and alter the law. He said, well, he said, I've been apply applying my aged lawyer's brain to this document, and I don't think it means what the Cabinet mission thinks it means. And then we knew we were done for. Congress acceptance did not last long. They tried to change the terms. Nehru and other Congress leaders made statements that amounted to rejection. But Jinnah had committed himself to a united India. He had given up Pakistan. When Congress backed away from the cabinet mission plan, Jinnah was convinced they were out to double-cross him. Angrily, he changed tactics. He declared, We have forged a pistol. We bid goodbye to constitutional methods. August the 16th, he called a day of action. In Calcutta, the League held a demonstration. Then the Muslims began three days of mass slaughter, the Calcutta killings. Hindu retaliation was swift and bloody. When the killings were over, four to five thousand lay dead, putrefying in the monsoon heat. A week later, when the army had put a stop to the looting and murder, the stench of death still hung over Calcutta. The Muslim flag is much in evidence in certain areas, though of course in some districts, Muslims and Hindus literally live on opposite sides of the same street. However futile and distressing, it's really not surprising that communal clashes still occur. British troops, these are infantrymen of the Yorks and Lanks driving Stuart tanks in a Muslim area, are regarded as a reassuring asset in this tense situation. The killing sparked retaliation far and wide. The murder launched by Jinnah's day of action continued in other parts of India for 16 months. Attlee knew that he had to propel India forward to independence before anarchy engulfed the whole country. In September 1946, the Viceroy set up an interim government with Nehru as chief minister. The Muslim League refused to join and boycotted it. The interim government was duly sworn in and Mr Nehru presided over the first cabinet meeting. Mr. Nehru emphasized the vital importance of cooperation among all Indians, 
But when he and his colleagues assembled on the balcony of the Viceroy's house, they had a mixed reception, though it's reported that cheering almost drowned the Muslim cries of long live Pakistan. The following months, the League reluctantly agreed to join. The Muslims went in to protect themselves from being isolated from negotiations with the British. It didn't go in a spirit of cooperation of running a smooth federal government of United India with the, with the Hindus, because that would have been a complete negation of what we had always been saying is impossible. The Muslim League Minister Abdul Rab Nashtar was in charge of communications. Uh, naturally, he wanted to be informed of what was going on inside the Congress Party. The easiest way was to, to him was for him to organize bugging at the telephone exchange. So the Muslim members of the interim government, or one of them at least, was bugging the telephones of a Congress member of the same government. Of all the Congress ministers, he had got. All the telephones bugged. And I'm not sure whether even the Viceroy's telephone was not bugged by him. The interim government, intended as a coalition, was now two warring groups. Wavell was near to despair. One day, towards the end of August, when I was riding with him, he said that next month I finished three years in this job. And I said to him, how do these three years compare with the earlier three years you had in the Middle East. He said, there's no comparison. I knew something about that job. Did he really feel out of his depth like that? I think he was beginning to feel that the situation was getting beyond his resolution, his powers of resolving it. Do you think London felt that as well? Yes, I think London began to feel that too. And I think, I don't know at what point they began thinking of a successor, but I would guess it was from that autumn. In December 1946, Attlee summoned the Viceroy and the Indian leaders to London in a desperate effort to get the League and Congress to cooperate. I am very happy that I am at this function and uh, already I had the opportunity of meeting some friends and uh, I might yet find more friends, but you give me no time to do anything else. <laughs> the talks got nowhere. Attlee decided on drastic action. When this complete impasse had been reached, we decided that the only hope was to send out another viceroy. If we were putting all our faith in the possibility of persuading the Indian leaders, uh, to agree about the future of India, we had to send someone out with the personality that was most likely to achieve our objective. There were two telegrams. There was a, a, a first one which explained that there was going to be a new Viceroy and certain of the practical details about it. And then, uh, they were cipher telegrams, of course, and then it said at the end, uh, name follows in, uh, name, name in my following telegram. And then the follow-up telegram simply had the one word, Mount Patton. you can't afford to miss returns to ABC this Wednesday at 8 o'clock. The Investigators. As a wave of killing swept across North India, Britain announced the date of her departure. The Raj would end in just 16 months, June 1948. 
For the overstretched British of the Indian police, the Indian Empire, after 150 years, could not end fast enough. Certainly I was almost at the end of my tether. We've been rioting since November 1946, with practically no rest, no sleep. And day after day, there was one crisis or another to deal with. Muhammad Ali Jinnah led 90 million Muslims, a quarter of the population, who feared Britain would hand them over to the 300 million Hindus. The Muslims dreaded a Hindu Raj. Civil war now threatened. I felt that we were stretched to the limit of our resources. And my police were having to operate in such appalling conditions. And there were mob confrontations. And uh, I got terribly worried about my police because whereas before all this boiled up, it was anti-British. Now they realized, the crowds realized that, it was, that we were determined to grant independence. And it became virulently a case of hatred between the communities. The violence engulfed five huge provinces of northern India. The Hindu majority in one village, hearing of their kinsfolk killed in another, turned on the few Muslims in their midst. Rumour spread the infection of slaughter. The province of the Punjab was to be the heart of Pakistan, the homeland the Muslims wanted carved out of India. Around the capital, Lahore, Muslims were the majority. Here they felt secure. But the east of the Punjab was dominated by Sikhs. They had a warrior tradition and were close allies of the Hindus. Sikh fear of being swept into Pakistan now raised their hatred of Muslims to a frenzy. The smell of death hung over the Punjab. As the British prepared to go, the killing threatened to become organized mass slaughter. My Sikh and Hindu police were being singled out by the Muslim mobs for, uh, for violence. And in fact, they came along to me saying, you British and your Muslim police could do what they like to us, but we're not going to have your Hindus and Sikhs. We won't answer for the consequences. So it was a very worrying situation because we were a thoroughly integrated force. Labour Prime Minister Clement Attlee decided that he must himself take charge. Attlee had one objective, Britain must quit India. The mood of the government at home was to decolonialize. Uh, so far as I was concerned, I was impressed by the fervor of, of the nationalist movement in India, and I thought, if there's no disposition at home, and it just wasn't on in the political climate of the times to maintain our rule in India by force, uh, the sooner we got out, the better. Britain's capacity to dominate India had been drained by six years of war. The British presence had been cut to the bone. Half the district officers were Indian now. With the violence between the two communities, Hindus and Sikhs on the one side, Muslims on the other, getting worse, the British felt it was essential to go quickly, before they totally lost control. The danger was worst in Lahore. The Muslims got up on their roofs and they were shouting to each other across the rooftops the Urdu word for beware, khabadar, khabadar. This sounded almost like a pack of jackals. I think people were simply scared to death. People who had been living quite peacefully for many years, uh, Muslims at one end of the street, Hindus or Sikhs at the other, uh, they suddenly found that they couldn't trust uh, their neighbors. They were really terrified of being bombed or shot at or having a house set fire to. There was a sort of snowball effect of fear spreading right through the city in the hall. And the same thing, I think, happened in Amritsar and other uh, big cities in, in the Punjab. It was very awful to watch it happen. I personally saw a lorry load of 
corpses. There were women who had been stripped naked, appallingly mutilated, and left on the side of the road in the whole city. Uh, since they were Muslim women, I could only assume that they had been murdered by Sikhs or Hindus. Muhammad Ali Jinnah led the Muslim League. 